It says, beginning two and a third miles from home, Jonathan drove away from home at a constant rate for 20 minutes. If his constant rate is 35 miles per hour, how far is he from home after 20 minutes? So there's different ways that you could go about this. For me personally, the way I think about it, if you were traveling 35 miles per hour, that means in one hour you would travel 35 miles. But he's not traveling for one hour. He's only traveling for 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes is what fraction of an hour? So you could think of it as 20 over 60, which simplifies to be one-third. So he's traveling a third of that distance. So I would do 35 miles an hour times a third. That's going to leave me with, I'm just going to leave it as a fraction if I multiply that. That means that he's traveled 35 third miles. This is on top of the additional two and a third miles he was already away from his house. So I would need to add this number to this fraction. So let's make this an improper fraction. So two and a third, you do two times three is six plus one is seven. So he was already seven thirds of miles from home. And he's won another 35 thirds. So if I add those together, that is 42 thirds, which simplifies to be 14 miles. So he is currently 14 miles away from home at the end of 20 minutes. B, explain how the graph on the right might represent the situation. Okay, well, notice the y-intercept is at two and a third. So let's see, we could say the y-intercept represents the distance Jonathan was away from home when he began at time T equals zero. So that's talking about the y-intercept, how that represents the situation. We also need to talk about the slope. So what do we notice about the slope of this line? Well, because it's a line, it's a constant rate. So because graph is linear, John traveled at a constant rate. That's really the main things they want you to notice. They also want you to talk about one more thing is what was his distance away from home at the end? And then so 14 miles away from home when time was equal to 20 minutes. Okay, for two, it says Susan, Jonathan's sister, also drove away from home, beginning two and a third miles from home, and followed the same path as Jonathan. She kept varying her velocity by frequently speeding up and slowing down. She arrived at the same location as Jonathan at the end of 20 minutes. So A says, explain how the graph to the right could represent Susan's path. So again, it has the same start point, two and a third miles, the same end point, which is 20, but notice that it's not a straight line, which means she didn't travel with constant velocity. She traveled faster at some points and then slowed down, maybe came to a stop, right? She's not going any, if she's moving at all, it's very slowly. Then she speeds up and then it's kind of constant there, then begins to slow down, then speeds up. So sometimes faster, sometimes slower, right? She could have been at red lights, but she also went faster than 35 at some points as well. So again, you could just type that out in, in uh, words. So three says, what's the average velocity for both drivers by calculating the change in position divided by the change in time? These two calculations will have the same value explain why that makes sense. So if you look at John, Go back and look at John's graph. 
the beginning point was at zero, two and a third. And the ending point was at 2014. So if you think about setting up, again, if you're looking for the average velocity, velocity is distance divided by time. So how much distance was traveled? We could do the slope formula. 14 minus 2 and a third divided by 20 minus 0. And then think about what the points are for Susan. She started at the same place, and her graph also goes to the point 20, 14. So if you think about 14 minus 2 and a third over 20 minus 0, it doesn't really matter what these numbers are. It's the same formula, which means they have the same average velocity. And again, the key word there is average. Were they going the same speed the entire time? No, Susan changed her speed. She sped up, she slowed down. But John was constant, 35 miles an hour the whole time. But on average, they went the same distance in the same amount of time. Four, on the graph that shows Susan's position, draw the line segment that connects points at t equals 0 and t equals 20. So if I had this point at t equals 0 and this point t equals 20, a line that connects those two points would be like, and I'm trying my best to draw it here, something like that. That's the average rate of change. And so what's the slope of that line segment? Well, we just found it. It was um, 14 minus 2 and a third over 20 minus 0. They did that calculation for us and got 0.5833. And how does the slope of this line compare to the slope of Jonathan's line? It's the same. Same slope. Because the blue line is actually Jonathan's line, right? That's Jonathan's path. Okay, 5 says, if the speed limit over the entire path is 35 miles per hour, did Susan ever drive over this speed limit? And explain your answer by referring to Susan's graph. So if this blue line represents driving 35 miles per hour, did she ever go faster than that? Well, yeah, right here her distance went up faster than this one. So she had to have gone over 35 miles an hour. And then somewhere in here she was slowed down. Right, Jonathan got ahead of her and then passed her back. It's kind of like the, uh, I'm thinking of the tortoise and the hare, right? That old famous story. The black line's the hare. It can go faster, but it gets distracted. Right, this time they tied instead of the hare winning. They got to the same place at the same time. At the end, right, but it's the same kind of idea. They took, had different speeds that they took to get there. Okay, so looking at this graph, six kind of talks about stuff that I've already been talking about. So sorry if I've ruined this big reveal for you. It says, for a nonlinear position function, which is what we have here, right? This is not in a line. So it's a nonlinear position function. The exact velocity at a particular time called the instantaneous rate of change or instantaneous velocity cannot be calculated precisely without calculus. However, the velocity can be estimated by approximating the slope of a short line segment drawn tangent to the curve at a particular time. On the graph showing Susan's distance, located at least one time when Susan's instantaneous velocity has the same value as the average velocity. So you're just thinking here, if I had to draw a tangent line to the black graph, that has the same slope as the blue graph. In my head, that's going to happen right here at these curves. Right, so right there, if I drew a slope to the tangent line, that's the same as the blue, or even up here. Right, that has the same slope. Same slope as the blue there and there. Right? It happens at those curves. And so they tell you to position a straight edge. They're telling you how to draw a tangent line. Um, Hopefully we've talked about that enough that you can kind of visualize it without having to have a straight edge. 
7. Using the function g of x shown in the graph, draw a small tangent line segment at each labeled point. A small tangent line is drawn at point P as a sample. Match the slope of each label point on the curve with an approximate rate of change value in the table. The slope at each point is called its instantaneous rate of change at any point because we're looking at the slope, right, the rate of change at one point. That's really what this is talking about. We know how to find the slope of a line if we're given two points. But for a tangent line, we're just finding the slope at one point which is what makes it be an instantaneous rate of change. So as we look here, we've done a problem similar to this before. So let's just find the slope of each of these tangent lines. So it looks like at A, it's a peak. So if I drew a tangent line, it would be a flat line. So its slope would be zero. So that one's kind of the easy one there to look at. Right. Um, if I looked at B, slow with tangent line would be here. It's got to be negative. There's only one that's negative, so I'm gonna guess that has to be B. If I drew a tangent line at C. It looks like between B and C, actually, the graph is almost linear. You guys notice that? that? There's not too much of a curve there. And so I guess I'm going to say the slope of a tangent line at C has to also be negative. So because there's only one negative choice, then I'm going to say negative 2 has to be B and C. If I look at D... The graph is starting to flatten out. So if I drew a tangent line at D, it would be like so. So it's also going to be a slope of zero. Okay, if I look at E, E happens at a valley. So its slope would also be zero. Maybe we'll get to 6 and 15 here in a second. Looks like we're fixing to. If I look at F, it has a positive slope, and it is pretty significant. And then G, because we're going straight up, it's going to be even more straight up. That tangent line should be. So if I have to, I'm going to say that 6 would have to be F, and 15 would have to be G. And it really doesn't look like there's that big of a difference, though, to me. Uh, but if I have to fit into those choices, that would have to be the way it'd have to go. It says here the graph represents the position, X of T, of an object. So that means the Y value is the position moving along a line extending perpendicularly from a wall at a given time t measured in seconds. So this would be time. The x values are time. The distance between the object and the wall is indicated on the vertical axis while time is measured on the horizontal axis. So it says, A, what do the coordinates of B being at 0.13 and 27.5 and, and D being at 219 represent. So this means at 0 0.13 seconds, right, because X is time. So at 0 0.13 seconds, the object is, and then what did the Y represent? It is the distance between the object and the wall. So at 0 0.13 seconds, the object is 27.5 inches. I was looking for what the units were and it tells me there. Inches away from the wall. 
and hopefully you can do the same for D. D means two seconds in. The object was 19 inches from the wall. So here B says mark small tangent line segments on each of the points that are named. Small tangent line segments on all the named points. So if B would have to be here, and then G, Z, F, D, K, A, and C, right, just in general, some little small tangent line segments. Using these tangent segments for which points is the instanta instantaneous rate of change negative? So I'm looking for where the s slope would be negative. So that looks like I'm here at this point, which is V. And at D, we're also negative. And so what is happening at those two points? What's happening to the motion? Well, remember, this is the distance away from the wall. So if the slope is negative, the distance of the way from the wall is getting less. So that means the object is moving towards the wall. Object moves towards the wall. Okay, and then if I look at C, observing the tangent line, observing the tangent segments, which intervals is the object moving away from the wall? So we're getting farther away from the wall. And then what does this mean in the context of the function? So away from the wall is happening at G. It's happening at A and at C. Those are the positive slopes. Right, so that's the second part of the question. What do the slopes of these mean in the context? We have positive slopes when we're moving away from the wall. D, at which point says the object stop moving and describe the slope of the tangent line at these positions? So it looks like the object has stopped moving at B, at Z, and at K. And we know that because the slope is zero, which means at that point it's not moving towards the wall or away from the wall. It's kind of being still. Right, and what's happening is it's switching its direction. Right, we're moving away from the wall, and then we stop, and we have to start moving towards the wall. And then once we get to the wall, we stop because we bounce off the wall, it looks like. E, speed indicates how fast an object is moving. Order the speeds at the following points from least speed to the greatest speed. So if I look at Z... Z was here at the top, so Z has no speed, so it has to be the slowest. And then if I'm looking between G, G is this little red one here. Sorry, I know this is a bundle to look at on mine. Hopefully you can look at it at your paper. And then D is this one here. So which one's moving faster? Well, we would look for the one with the most severe slope, either positive or negative. So because D has the steepest slope, even though it's negative, that's where it's moving the fastest. We just know it's moving fastest towards the wall. And then at G, where it was positive slope, it's moving, but not as quickly as at D, but because the slope is positive, that means we're moving away from the wall. So this is wrapping this up for today. Um, this is Thursday. Friday, you will not have a video. Friday, you're going to be reviewing both the Detective Zero and the What is Pamela's Current Speed. You're going to try to do both of those in class, do all parts of it. When we come in Monday, we'll do the, the rates of change. We'll do the two quick notes for those, and then... I'll answer any questions that you guys have. We'll make sure we've got all the answers correct. I might go ahead and post the correct answers for you on Friday so you can look at them after you're finished. 
Um, and then I can answer questions on Monday. I'll be here. And then Tuesday, September 19th, we'll have our big test. So another thing I've written on the board, hopefully you are wrapping up your Canvas stuff. The stuff that we've covered in this unit is 2.1, 2.2, 1.5, 3.1, 3.2, 3.4, 3.3, and 1.4 in that order. Um, and then also remember you have to do 1.1 and 1.3 on your own. You have about a month left to complete those. So don't forget about those as well.